Hey, and welcome to another edition of This Day in Sports History, a member of the Sports History Network. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. It's July 15th, and on this day in 1994, it was a story of cheating, intrigue, and subterfuge, with some of the details not revealed until many years later. The Cleveland Indians were playing at Chicago's Comiskey Park on this night. The teams were back from the All-Star break, and this game was just one of many remaining on the schedule. A ho-hum game in July, until it wasn't. This was the second game of a three-game series between the Indians and White Sox. The night before, Chicago had won 6-3, but in that game, Albert Bell hit a two-run homer in the first inning, his 26th of the season. White Sox manager Gene Lamont had been given a little intel that Bell's bat may be corked. When Bell came to the plate for the first time on this night, Lamont went to home plate umpire Dave Phillips to express his concern that Bell's bat had been modified, which is illegal, and that he wanted it checked out. Well, it's not an immediate process. It needed to be x-rayed to see if the bat had been corked or not. The bat was confiscated and sent back to the umpire's dressing room to be checked later. Bell grabbed a teammate's bat and play continued. And that's when the intrigue began. Bell's teammates knew his bats were corked and that it was only a matter of time before the x-ray would prove that to be the case with obviously heavy fines and a suspension to follow. So a plan was hatched to switch the bat with an uncorked one. One hitch in that plan was that Bell's teammates also knew that all of his bats were illegal and a swap would need to be made with someone else's legal timber. Pitcher Jason Grimsley was a willing foot soldier and he came up with a daring plan. He went all Tom Cruise and Mission Impossible with a pen light in his mouth guiding his way through a ventilation shaft in the ceiling, he crawled his way to the umpire's dressing room. He had time. The game would go on for another two and a half hours. He dropped through the vent in the ceiling, grabbed Bell's bat, and switched it with one of Paul Sorrento's bats. Back into the vent he went, crawled back the other way, and was soon back in the Indian's dugout. All clear. Until it wasn't. In the sixth inning, a custodian entered the manager's locker room and noticed pieces of ceiling tile on the carpet and that a few of the metal pieces holding the drop ceiling in place were bent. Cleveland went on to win the game 3-2. Bell had gone one for four with two strikeouts, using someone else's bat. When the umpires got back to their locker room, they took one look at the bat and knew something was amiss. The bat they'd sent back to the locker room was not the one that they were now looking at. It was very different, and besides, this one had Paul Sorrento's name burned into it. The police were called. The umps went all Hercule Poirot and started interviewing Cleveland players about where the bat was, who had it. They wanted the original, but it had been stuffed deep into another player's locker. So instead, they asked for another Albert Bell bat. If only... If only he'd had a regular legal bat with his name on it. But, again, he did not. They were all court. An FBI agent was actually flown in the next day to investigate the theft. The American League office ordered Cleveland to produce the original or the full force of the FBI would be coming down on them. So, finally, Bell's original bat was produced, analyzed, and found to be an illegally corked bat. The FBI investigation was dropped, and Bell was suspended for 10 games originally, but after an appeal, it was reduced to seven games. It would hardly matter in a few weeks, though. Players went on strike in August, wiping out the remainder of the regular season and the postseason. It wasn't until five years later that Grimsley's role in the caper was actually revealed. In an interview with the New York Times in 1999, and later corroborated by Omar Vizquel, Grimsley admitted that he was the burglar. On this day in 1912, Jim Thorpe won the Olympic gold medal for the decathlon in Stockholm, Sweden. 
Now, if you remember back to the July 7th edition of this dish, I talked about Thorpe's win in the pentathlon. Now, a little over a week later, Thorpe was putting the finishing touches on the decathlon. The event, featuring 10 different competitions, began on the 13th and ended on the 15th. In that three-day span, Thorpe won the shot put, high jump, the 110-meter hurdles, and finally the 1,500 meters. His time in the 1,500-meter run was 4 minutes 40 seconds, a time that would not be bettered by a decathlete in the Olympics for another 60 years. He won the gold with 8,412 points, 688 points more than Sweden's Hugo Wieslander. 29 men started the event, but only 12 finished. Sweden's King Gustav declared Thorpe to be the world's greatest athlete. The Olympic team was celebrated with a ticker tape parade in New York upon their return, with Thorpe said to have received the loudest cheers. But a little more than six months later, the U.S. Olympic Committee discovered that Thorpe had been paid $25 a week to play baseball in North Carolina in the summer of 1910 and 1911, violating its strict and draconian rules on amateurism. Despite the discovery being past the 60-day window to file an opposition, punishment was swift and severe. And on this day in 1913, Thorpe was stripped of his two gold medals. Wieslander was awarded the gold in the decathlon, and Norway's Ferdinand Bia was awarded the gold in the pentathlon, though Bia refused to accept it, feeling that Thorpe had won fairly. Thorpe never fought the decision, despite a severe blow to his reputation that he would never truly recover from in the eyes of the public. He once told his daughter Grace, I want him and I know I want him. In 1982, there was a thawing of sorts as the International Olympic Committee awarded duplicate gold medals to Thorpe's surviving family members, but still listed Wieslander and Bia as co-champions in the events. It took another 40 years for the IOC to finally right the wrong in its entirety. On July 15, 2022, 110 years after winning the decathlon, the IOC finally recognized Thorpe as the true and only winner of the Olympic pentathlon and decathlon in 1912. On this day in different years, we said hello to one golf champion and goodbye to another. On this day in 1923, Bobby Jones won his first major golf tournament. Playing the U.S. Open in Inwood, New York, Jones and Bobby Cruikshank were locked in an 18-hole playoff. They stepped up to the 18th still all square with the possibility of another 18-hole playoff to follow if it could not be settled here. Both drives wound up in the tall grass, Cruikshank laid up, Jones fired a precise two-iron to within eight feet of the pen. Crookshank failed to get up and down for par, Jones two-putted for his four, and the U.S. Open Championship. It was the start of an eight-year domination of the game of golf that saw him win another three U.S. Opens, three British Opens, five U.S. Amateurs, and a British Amateur. And then fast-forwarding to 2005, Jack Nicklaus finished his golf career at the birthplace of golf, St. Andrews. Walking to the 18th hole on this day, Nicholas received a 10-minute ovation, stopped for a long moment on the Swilcan Bridge to soak in the moment, and then, in true Golden Bear fashion, rolled in his 15-foot birdie putt to shoot an even par 72 and close out his amazing 43-year professional golf career. Time now for today's non-sports Did You Know? In the 1893 case Nix versus Hedden, the Supreme Court ruled that tomatoes are vegetables, at least for tax purposes. So there you have it. If you ever need to settle the age-old debate, just cite the precedent set in that 130-year-old case. That's all for now. Come on back tomorrow for another edition of This Day in Sports History. This has been an original Thrive Suite production.